I wondered, angrily, why the phone was ringing at three in the morning. I rolled stiffly onto my side and blindly stuck out my hand. I felt around the nightstand for my phone, but it wasn't there. With a groan, I rolled out of bed onto my feet. I stretched my neck and stood up. The phone continued its excessive ringing. Shout out a grand for the damn thing. Why not sprout legs and come to me for once? I muttered to myself as I walked out of the room. I flipped the light on in my small apartment and winced at the sudden brightness. I found my phone sitting on the counter. I just missed the call. Why? I groaned as I picked it up. One new voicemail from Eddie. Sarah, you have to help me. I know it's stupid, but I had to come back out here. I didn't like where this was heading. I just need to know what happened to her. It's been ten years, but she was my sister. I have to know what happened. I could hear the sounds of branches snapping in the background. Eddie must have gone out into the woods again. But why so late? He's only ever gone during the day and never alone. I thought I could find something. You know, with it being the anniversary and all, but... He was interrupted by a low growl coming from all around him. Oh, God. He screamed. And I could hear him running. I heard what sounded like him fall and scramble. Damn you, Sarah. Why didn't you just answer the phone? He was trying to keep his voice down, but I could hear that he was terrified. There's something wrong with the woods. My heart was beating out of my chest at this point. My phone is almost dead. Damn, okay. If you get this, Sarah, come find me. You know where I am. His breathing seemed strained now. He sounded injured in some way. Please. That was the end of the voicemail. Damn it, Eddie. I shook my head. What have you done? It was a redundant question. I knew exactly why he went out there. Eddie's younger sister, Mabel, went missing 10 years ago in the woods just outside town. The police and pretty much everyone else in town chalked it up to her just getting lost. People had been going missing in those woods for years. The search didn't go on for long before they found something. Her heart. Just lying there in the woods. They ended up declaring it an animal attack. Mostly just to close the case. Eddie and I were there when she went missing. Neither of us can remember what happened. Repressed memory or something. What we do know is that it was no animal attack. A few minutes later and I was on my way. It was a small town and pretty much everything was closed. The only light came from the street lamps and my headlights. Their light reflected off the freshly fallen snow. I could feel a headache forming just behind my eyes. I blinked a few times in a vain attempt to prevent it. Soon I was past the small shops and was on the final stretch to the woods. I came upon Eddie's green pickup truck, but no Eddie. I pulled up next to his truck and got out, making sure to grab the pistol I always kept in the glove compartment, just in case. Flecks of snow fell upon my face in the winter night. I cursed myself for not bringing a thicker jacket. I shone the light from my phone into the windows of Eddie's pickup, but as I expected, Nothing of interest, or so I thought. As I moved away, something shone from under the driver's seat. I stuck my pistol in my back pocket and pulled on the door handle. It swung open. Eddie usually kept it locked. I knelt and grabbed what turned out to be Eddie's phone. But how? Where the hell are you, Ed? I whispered to myself. Had he come back here after calling me? That was the only way his phone would be here, right? I pulled the phone out, pressed the power button. A little battery icon popped up on the screen. The phone had died as Eddie's son. Must have been why the call ended earlier. That's what I hoped at least. I pocketed Eddie's phone and scanned the area, hoping to find something else but all I found was snow, trees, and the sign marking the nature trail. Guess I know where I'm going next. I muttered to myself, noting that I was doing that a little too much. Joyful Trails Nature Walk, the sign ran. Joyful wasn't a word anyone would use to describe this place. The number of urban legends surrounding this place was way too many to count. Stories of ghosts, Bigfoot-like creatures, even some cult out in the woods were the talk of the town for decades. All that ended when Mabel went missing. It seemed that no one wanted to believe anymore once the stories got closer to home. Eddie and I were the only ones that still talked about those legends. We were convinced that one of them had to be responsible for Mabel's death. We'd been out to these woods so many times over the years, but only ever during the day. Walking down the trail at night, 
it felt like an entirely different place. I tried my best to keep my cool, telling myself that every rustle in the bushes was simply a little bunny, or maybe that sound in the trees was just a friendly bird. In truth, it felt like I was being not just watched, but followed by something very different. I pushed onward, panning the light across the bushes and trees as I did so. Every so often the light would catch in the eyes of some critter. As soon as my gaze met theirs, they vanished into the darkness. That only added to the feeling of being watched. I shivered and pulled a pistol from my back pocket for comfort. The further down the path I went, the further I began to feel as if I wasn't in the woods anymore. There were trees I didn't recognize, and the path seemed to curve in ways it never had in the last decade I'd been coming out here. I remembered the path going straight, but here it took a sharp left turn. Straight ahead was nothing but a thick wall of trees. For a second I thought of turning back, but I remembered why I came out here in the first place. Eddie needed my help. After a while, the darkness seemed to shift and warp around me. I felt like I was trapped, surrounded by shadow. Even the light of the phone did little to combat the belligerent darkness. I was walking near blindly for what felt like forever, before the darkness finally lifted. The area opened up to reveal a cabin. There hadn't been a cabin out here before, and it would have taken some time to build, I would have noticed. The building seemed to be in good condition. Despite this, I got the distinct feeling that this place hadn't been touched in a very long time. The path below my feet had turned from dirt into a cobblestone walkway leading up to the front door. The sounds of rustling leaves and tree branches had stopped. It was eerily silent now. All I could hear were the sounds of my breathing and my racing heart. A cool breeze pushed against my back, nudging me ever so slightly forward. I tightened my grip on the gun and moved, one footstep at a time. Is someone out there? A male voice said from inside. I nearly jumped out of my skin. I didn't expect anyone to be in there. I had a glimmer of hope that the voice was Eddie's, but it sounded too old. Ah, uh, yeah? I answered. My name's Sarah. I'm looking for my friend. I waited for a response, but none came. Instead, the front door slowly creaked open. Inside I saw nothing but shadows. Shadows that seemed to call to me. I took a step forward, then another, and another. As if in a trance, I made my way towards the waiting maw. Come on in, Sarah, the voice said from inside. I can help you find your friend. I stepped through the doorway. It shut behind me. Sealing me away in the darkness, I rubbed the fog from my eyes and tried to clear my head. The inside of the cabin was very clean. There weren't any lights that I could see, but as soon as the door closed, the room lit up. While the outside of the house was large, the inside was much smaller, at least this part. The front door led into a single room with no windows or doors leading anywhere. At least the singular room was a nice one. It was a sitting room of sorts. Hardwood floors with a large area rug, topped by two felt armchairs. One of these armchairs was occupied. The frail-looking old man stared at me with the blankest eyes I've ever had the misfortune of seeing. He was dressed in silk pajamas and a matching cap. Between the armchairs was a small table. He lifted a glass from it and sipped the dark liquid. Who are you? I asked. My voice sounded strange in this place. He set the glass back down with a shaky hand. There's no fun in telling you that. Shivers went down my spine. What do you want? To help, he said. His tone shifted slightly. He sighed and stood shakily from his chair. That is what you want, right? To find him before it finds the both of you. It? I questioned, unconsciously raising my gun ever so slightly. A being of these woods. He gestured broadly, a hunter of sorts. Not the brightest thing, but it serves its purpose, as I serve my own. Purpose? I shook my head. Look, I'm just trying to find my friend. I didn't have the time for this nonsense. He gave me a dismissive wave of the hand as he paced in front of me. So far, he'd paid no mind to the gun in my hand. You want to find your friend? I can help with that. He gave me an eerie smile. His eyes darted to the door and back to me as if waiting for something. Okay, where is he then? Through here. He waved his wrinkled hand and a door formed upon the far wall. You'll find your friend on the other side of that door. 
I... Thanks. I didn't know what else to say. I walked past the strange old man in pajamas and grasped the doorknob. Before I turned the knob, my curiosity got the better of me. Why did you help me? I asked. What's that? He asked. He had returned to his chair. Why did you help me? I asked once more. He laughed and reached for his glass. I helped myself in the woods. I kept you busy. A monstrous banging emanated from the door I entered from. You'd better get going if you want to find your friend alive. He gently set the glass down. I almost said something, but suddenly whatever was fighting so fiercely to get inside finally won. The door came crashing down and a large, black mass landed heavily upon the shattered remains. It was like a large dog or maybe a wolf. It was hard to tell because the beast was made almost entirely of shadow. All but its eyes. Marbles of red against the inky blackness. It stared at me with crimson fury. The wall behind the creature crumbled as if made of dust, revealing the trees beyond. The beast lunged at me, going past the old man without even a glance. In a panic, I quickly pointed my gun at the creature and fired three times. The first bullet went straight through, doing absolutely no damage. The second bullet had the same effect. The third bullet, however, winged the left eye, sending red shards flying in a flash of scarlet light. The beast wailed and tumbled, but its momentum wasn't halted. The beast slammed into me, and I flew backwards. The door shattered at my back and I landed hard against the dirt. I jumped up to see the doorway still there. Through it was the room. Behind it was trees. The beast was still in the room crumpled on the ground, but I knew it wasn't done. A gun was lying right next to it. I must have dropped it when I got hit. Before I could make a move to grab it, the doorway disappeared leaving in the woods with no cabin in sight. I grabbed my phone off of the ground. Although the light was useless now, it seemed to be about midday. And judging by the sun, but my phone said the time was 4.30 a.m. After what I just witnessed, it didn't seem all that weird. I stuffed my phone in my pocket and took in my surroundings. I had hoped that I was back in the woods, but I wasn't. I don't know what these woods were, but they didn't seem natural. I saw a path leading off away from where the door had been. I wasn't sure if the path had been there before, but I hadn't been paying enough attention before. I didn't know where the path would lead, but the old man did say I'd find Eddie, so I had to follow the path, wherever it may lead. The path seemed to go on forever, but eventually, I reached a small clearing. Eddie was on the ground, his back against a tree. His skin was white, and he seemed frail. Eddie? I asked. My voice came out as little more than a whisper. I moved towards him. His head slowly turned to face me. It seemed to take a considerable effort to do just that. I didn't know how I was going to get him out of there. I soon learned that I wouldn't have to. His clothes were torn, and I could see his chest. There weren't any scratches or blood, but right where his heart would be was a large black splotch. It seemed to emanate shadows, much like the beast I just encountered. Oh fuck, what happened to you? I rushed over to get a better look. His gaze followed me, but there didn't seem to be much life behind it. I moved aside what was left of his shirt and assessed the damage. It wasn't so much a splotch, but a hole, but not a hole that torn into him. It was more like part of it was vanishing, dissolving, just as the room had. His heart was disappearing before my eyes, and there wasn't a thing I could do to help. The old man said I'd find him, but he never said I'd be able to save him. He mumbled. Eddie? It's me. Eddie? It's Sarah. His gaze seemed to go right through me, as if I wasn't there at all. Seeing him like this nearly broke me. I tried to stop it, but I could feel tears start to roll down my cheeks. M Mabel? He wheezed. His time was up. I watched as the remaining life behind his eyes fade in. I didn't have time to mourn as I heard the familiar growl of the beast. I wasn't sure if it was after me or Eddie's corpse, but I wasn't going to wait around and find out. I didn't have my gun anymore, so all I could do was run. Run for my life. I ran until my legs felt like jelly and my lungs burned. The beast followed me for some time, but I think it decided to go for the easier meal. I just wished that easier meal hadn't been my friend. 
I ducked behind a bush and waited, just to make sure my assumption was correct. I slowly crept back out and pressed on. The sun was setting once more. I wasn't sure exactly where I was heading, but all I knew was it was away from that thing. Even in the daylight, I didn't feel safe. I still felt like I was being watched. I wish I had my gun. At least I was able to do some damage then. The eyes were the trick. They were actually marbles or something like them. In the rush of it all, I forgot that I didn't need a gun to defend myself. I grabbed what seemed to be a rather sturdy branch. Even I couldn't kill it. It would probably die trying with this. But it was better than having nothing. Now that I had some means of defending myself, I felt a little more comfortable pressing onwards. After a while, a path began to form at my feet. I followed it for a few minutes until the path forked. In between was a small sign, naming each path. The left, up, the right, down. It made no sense, but nothing seemed to anymore. Before I decided which path to take, I took the time to try and make heads or tails of this night. Eddie called me from the woods. It sounded like something was chasing him. Probably the creature I've encountered twice now. Thanks to Eddie. I think I know what the creature does to people. It removes their hearts. I don't know why or how, but I believe that's what happened to Mabel. These woods are separate somehow. When the heart leaves these woods, it goes to my woods. What the purpose would be was still a mystery, but at least I had some understanding of this place. Both paths seemed to be on level ground for as far as I could see. Not sure what the names were about. The logical choice felt like up. Going left. But this wasn't a logical place. I chose to go right. Down. Whatever the hell that meant. I don't know quite how to explain it, but once the choice was made, I got a distinct feeling that there was no going back. I didn't make it far before the world around me vanished and a door slammed shut behind me. I was back in the room I had found in the cabin. And my stick was gone. So much for defending myself. There was no sign that the beast had been there earlier nor the old man in the armchair. Instead, I found myself with a young woman, only a few years younger than me. She was sitting in the opposite chair the old man had been in. She looked at me with curious eyes from behind her auburn hair. Auburn hair that seemed very familiar. Mabel? She stood from the chair and walked towards me. She looked me over and furrowed her brow. I don't know what you're talking about. She said flatly and returned to her chair. She looked exactly how I imagined Mabel would have looked, if she had never gone missing, but maybe it was a trick. The old man, I started. Where is he? She looked at me with curious eyes. Old man? She questioned. I don't know any old man. She crossed her legs and stared at me. Never mind. I changed the subject. How do I get out of here? I wasn't sure she would help me, but I had to try. Out? She asked. You can't get out. She grabbed the collar of her shirt, which I noticed was nearly identical to the one Mabel had been wearing a decade ago, and pulled it down. Where her heart should have been was a black, shadowy hole just like Eddie had. These woods take your heart. She covered the hole and sighed heavily. The process has already begun for you. She pointed at me, at my chest. Go ahead, see for yourself. She snapped her fingers and a tall mirror took form in front of me. The night had not been kind to me. As she said, I pulled down the collar of my shirt. To my horror, I found that she was right. There was a small, black shadow forming over my heart. I didn't even feel it. I thought the beast had caused the hole in Eddie's chest, but now I wasn't so sure. Could the beast simply be an inhabitant of these otherworldly woods? Could the woods themselves really be what takes the heart? How long do I have? I asked. She chuckled at me. It was Mabel's chuckle. You're surprisingly calm about this. I wasn't, but I didn't see the point in freaking out now. I realized my shirt and the mirror disappeared. She was standing in its place. Why is this happening? I asked. What is this place? She paused for a moment before responding. The woods need souls, bodies to inhabit it. 
She took a few steps backwards. She seemed unbalanced. What about the heart? Why take the heart? I asked. I stepped forward and placed my hands on her shoulders. Her eyes had grown foggy. What was happening to her? Leave a trail. Bring others. Her voice had changed slightly. A bit rougher. Like Eddie? I had hoped the mention of him would spark something but no luck. The boy called for help. It was unforeseen. She said, her voice now clearly not her own, but we adapted. She began to shake slightly and found you. You're different. The vessels feel something. It's fighting. Vessel? Could she really be? Mabel? Her eyes rolled back into her head and she went limp. I was barely able to keep her from falling to the ground. The struggle brought me down to my knees, but I managed. Mabel, are you alright? She didn't answer. She just lied there, limp and lifeless. I checked her pulse before realizing that she wouldn't have one without a heart. I pulled out my phone and held it under her nose. She was breathing, at least. I set my phone on the floor and hauled Mabel up. I dragged her over to the chair and sat her down. Soon enough, she opened her eyes. Sarah? She said. Her voice had changed once more. It was almost innocent. Sarah, where am I? Mabel, is that really you? She was starting to panic. I tried my best to comfort her. She nodded weakly. Sarah? She was starting to calm down. You look different. I couldn't help but laugh a little. I'm a little older than the last time we saw each other. She simply nodded. I could see in her eyes that part of her was deep in thought. What do you remember? She looked at me. Although she had been through a lot, I could see the Mabel I knew in her eyes. I felt something click within me, like something was unlocking for both of us. I remember, she started. I remember playing, the three of us, together. She grabbed my hand and held it tightly. The memory of that day was hazy for me as well. It had been for years. You, me, and Eddie. We were in the woods. She thought hard for a moment. What were we playing? Memories came back to me in brief glimpses. Eddie was by the tree, counting to thirty. Mabel and I were in the bushes, hidden from view. Hide and seek, I answered. We were playing hide and seek. She smiled. I remember now. Her voice sounded content. We were in the bushes. Maybe it was this place doing it, but my memories were getting clearer and clearer. Mabel and I were in the bushes, away from Eddie. We had always been friends, even though she was a grade below me and Eddie. Lately, things had begun to change between us. I would get butterflies in my stomach every time I saw her. It had been my idea to play hide and seek. It was mostly just a way to be alone with her. I remember the two of us huddled behind the bush as Eddie counted and... We kissed. It was my first kiss. How could I have forgotten that? But then we both ran. Eddie had finished counting, and we wanted to find better places to hide. Eddie found me easily, but not Mabel. I tried to help him, but it was no use. Then we heard the scream. We ran towards the sound, and Mabel was there, enclosed in shadows, screaming for help, screaming for me. She vanished, screaming my name, then we ran. By the time we got back to town, neither of us could remember anything. I could see that she had remembered it too. I'm sorry, Mabel. I'm so sorry. She shook her head at me and smiled. Don't be. You're here now. She pulled me closer, but a sharp pain shot through my chest. I cried out and jolted backward. Your time is almost up. A familiar voice said. I looked over to find the old man sitting in his armchair. Something was different about him, though. He didn't seem like the old man I'd met earlier. Ah, oh, you're back, my son. Most definitely with the slightest bit of sarcasm. He put his hands to show he was no threat. In a manner of speaking, he said, this time of my own free will. What? I asked. Mabel slipped out of her chair and put her arm around me. Last time you saw me, I wasn't myself. As I imagined this young woman... He gestured to Mabel. Was not herself. Something broke us free of their grip. Whose grip? I asked. 
and what broke you free? There are things here, beings of otherworldly power. They like to use us. He shook his head as if he were shaking away a bad thought. As for your other question, he nodded towards Mabel and I. I'd imagine that was love, remembered or otherwise. Mabel and I glanced at each other. I pulled the phone from my pocket. Eddie's phone. Eddie was here. Why didn't his love set you free? Surely it could have. Mabel stared at the phone in my hand. Oh no. I heard her whisper, trying to hold back tears. I'm sorry, Mabel. I wished I could have broken that to her a bit easier. Do you believe in soulmates? The old man asked. I do, and I think that's what did the trick. Soulmates, huh? That certainly explained my love life since then. Or lack thereof. Our conversation was interrupted by a loud, ferocious banging on the door. The beast was back. We're out of time. The old man's son. I could hear the urgency in his voice. Mabel, is it? Yeah. Mabel answered. Mabel, get her on her feet. She did as he bid her. We may not be under their influence any longer, but we still have some of their power. I've been here longer than you, and I've picked up a few things. What do you mean? Mabel asked as the banging on the door got louder. If we work together, I think we can open a door out of here. I could feel Mabel's heart beat faster against me. A door out of the woods, back into our world. I could tell by the banging that we only had a few minutes at best. Can you stand on your own? Mabel whispered to me. I nodded and she released me. My vision started to go black, but I held my ground. She walked over to the old man, and they linked hands. Focus, child. He son, focus on a way out. The door splintered and deep, black claws tore through it. With all the strength I could muster, I threw myself over the armchair. I rolled onto my back and my vision blurred. Sarah. I heard Mabel cry out. Focus or she's dead. The old man yelled. The beast slowly walked around the armchair. It seemed to ignore Mabel and the man. Maybe it didn't realize they weren't being controlled. It was the same one as before. It glared at me with its one crimson eye with absolute hatred. It's working. I heard Mabel yell. I looked to the wall next to me and saw a door beginning to take shape. It seemed to flutter in and out of focus. Keep going. We're almost there. The old man yelled back. The beast's low growl filled the room and it came closer. It wanted to savor the moment or else it would have pounced by now. I shuffled backward, kicking wildly in a vain attempt to hurt this thing. Then my hand hit something. My pistol. It's done. The two yelled in unison. The newly formed door swung open and caught the attention of the beast. I grabbed the gun but the creature saw me. It howled horribly and lunged. I turned the gun upwards and prayed that I wouldn't miss. Shards of crimson glass pelted my face as the beast let out a sickening wail. I watched as the wretched thing evaporated into the air before disappearing with a hiss. Mabel jumped over the chairs and quickly pulled me up. That was way too close, she said with a grin on her face. That's an understatement, I replied, returning the grin. Another sharp pain rang through my chest. The door won't stay open forever, and your heart is nearly gone. The old man's son, he seemed weakened by the ordeal. Let's go, Mabel said, steadying me. I looked through the open door. It was nearly dawn and I could see my car and Eddie's truck. I gripped Mabel's hand, and together we went through the door, both finally free of that horrible place. Or so I thought. Mabel wasn't behind me. I spun around to see her standing at the doorway, trying desperately to push her way through, but she couldn't. What's happening? I yelled. I tried to pull her through, but couldn't keep my grip as I passed the threshold. She lost her heart already, the old man said from behind her. She can't return with you. None of us can. No, there has to be a way. I grabbed from Mabel, but she pulled away. I don't think there is, she said, trying and failing not to cry. Tears rolled down my face as well. There must be, I screamed. The old man picked up my pistol and stuffed it in the waistband of his pants. 
We'll be all right, Ken. We can defend ourselves now. We have power here. He said, but it was of no comfort. Mabel, please just walk through. I yelled, just do it. I can't, she said calmly, stifling her tears. Go, Sarah. Live your life. Get away from this town. From these woods. I won't leave you. I can't leave you. I screamed. You don't have a choice. She said. I knew she was right, but I didn't want to believe it. Besides, Eddie's in here somewhere. Someone has to take care of him. She smiled. I don't know how she could smile at a time like this. Please. I mumbled. The door will close any second. The old man whispered to Mabel. She nodded back at him. Okay, this is it. She sighed. Don't say that. I said between tears. Please don't. Sarah, I never got the chance to say it then, so I'll say it now. She looked into my eyes and I tried my best to meet her gaze. I love you. And she was gone. The door vanished, never to be seen again. I screamed and threw myself forward, tearing at the ground in some vain attempt to get back to her. The sun broke through the trees, casting a pink and purple hue over the world around me. I got off the ground and wiped my eyes. I watched the sunrise and thought of her, how things might have been if she had never gone missing. I'll leave this town and live my life. I promise, Mabel. I walked over to my car and took one last look. And I love you too.